In this section, we'll look at the pelvic cavity. We'll look first at the bones and ligaments that surround the cavity. Then, we'll look at the muscles of the pelvic walls and the pelvic floor. Then, we'll see the principal blood vessels and nerves of the region. We'll start with the bones. We've already seen the upper parts of the bony pelvis. Now, we need to look at the parts of it that lie below the pelvic brim. Let's get oriented. Here's the bony pelvis, together with the fifth lumbar vertebra. Here's the pelvic brim. We'll be looking at the pelvic cavity from four different viewpoints. We look down into it from above. We'll look at it from the side, with the opposite half of the pelvis removed. We'll look at it from behind and we'll look at it from below. We looked at the features of the upper part of the bony pelvis in the last section. The bones that contribute to the walls of the pelvic cavity are the sacrum and the coccyx behind, and the lower parts of the hip bone in front and at the side. We're looking at the bones in the position they occupy when we're standing upright. In the upright position, the surface of the upper part of the sacrum is angled at 30 degrees to the horizontal. The tip of the coccyx points forward at about 40 degrees. So the pelvic surfaces of the sacrum and coccyx form a curve of a bit more than a quarter circle. The lower end of the sacrum is on a level with the top of the pubic symphysis. This big gap between the sacrum and the hip bone is called the sciatic notch. It's bridged by two major ligaments, as we'll see shortly. Now, we'll look at some details of the hip bone. This massively thick part of the hip bone is formed by the fusion of the ilium, the pubis, and the ischium. It's smooth on the inside and on the back. It's deeply indented on the outside by the socket of the hip joint, the acetabulum. This is the body of the ischium, which ends below in this impressive projection, the ischial tuberosity, which is what we sit on. This sharp prominence is the ischial spine. The large hole in the lower part of the hip bone is the obturator foramen. In the living body, it's largely closed off by the obturator membrane. This is the body of the pubis. The part of the hip bone below the obturator foramen is the ischiopubic ramus. The two ischiopubic rami, meeting in front at the pubic symphysis, form the pubic arch. When seen from the side, the ischiopubic rami slope backward and downwards toward the ischial tuberosities. There are important differences in shape between the male pelvis and the female pelvis, which is adapted to the important requirements of childbirth. The female pelvic cavity is wider from side to side and deeper from front to back than the male. In addition, the angle of the female pubic arch is broader. When seen from below, the inferior pelvic aperture of the female is wider in all directions than that of the male. Now that we've looked at the dry bones, we'll look at some major ligaments which are important in holding the sacrum and the hip bones together. The weight of the body is transmitted from the vertebral column to the hip bone at the sacroiliac joint. The sacroiliac joint is strengthened behind and in front by ligaments. The anterior sacroiliac ligament in front and the massive posterior sacroiliac ligament behind. In addition, the sacroiliac joint is strengthened by two major ligaments which pass from the sacrum to the ischium, the sacrotuberous and sacrospinous ligaments. Here's the sacrotuberous ligament. 
The sacrotuberous ligament arises here on the back of the sacrum. It passes laterally, downward, and slightly forward. It's inserted here on the ischial tuberosity. Now we'll add the sacrospinous ligament to the picture. Here it is. The sacrospinous ligament lies in front of the sacrotuberous ligament and medial to it. It goes from here on the edge of the sacrum to here on the ischial spine. These two ligaments divide the gap between the sacrum and the ischium into two openings, the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. Let's take a look at a complete pelvic specimen from behind and from below. The sacrotuberous ligaments behind and the ischiopubic rami in front form the boundaries of an opening beneath the pelvis that's called the inferior pelvic aperture. Seen from beneath, the opening looks like an ellipse, but it's not a flat ellipse. Because of the steep downward curve of the sacrotuberous ligaments behind and the slight downward slope of the ischiopubic rami in front, the ellipse has a marked bend in it. Here's the inferior pelvic aperture seen from above. When we look at it from up here, it's not so easy to appreciate the three-dimensional shape of the opening. Now, let's review what we've seen of the bones and ligaments that surround the pelvic cavity. Here's the hip bone, the sacrum, and the coccyx. Here's the sciatic notch. Here's the pelvic brim. Here's the obturator foramen, the body of the ischium, the ischial spine, and the ischial tuberosity. Here's the body of the pubis, the ischiopubic ramus, the pubic symphysis, and the pubic arch. Here are the sacroiliac ligaments, anterior and posterior. Here's the sacrotuberous ligament and the sacrospinous ligament. Here's the greater sciatic foramen and the lesser sciatic foramen. Now, we'll look at the muscles of the pelvic cavity. First, we'll look at two muscles which form part of the wall of the pelvic cavity, piriformis and obturator internus. Then, we'll look at the complex sheet of muscles, collectively called the pelvic diaphragm, which form the floor of the pelvic cavity. We'll look at these structures first in a male specimen. Piriformis and obturator internus are both hip rotator muscles, which arise within the pelvis and pass outward through the sciatic foramina. Here's piriformis. Piriformis arises from here on the sacrum. It passes laterally and leaves the pelvis through the greater sciatic foramen. We'll see where it goes in a minute. Next we'll add obturator internus to the picture. Obturator internus arises from the obturator membrane and from this wide area around it. Obturator internus leaves the pelvis through the lesser sciatic foramen. In doing so, it makes a 90 degree turn around the lower part of the ischium. Piriformis and obturator internus pass laterally to insert on the greater trochanter of the femur. Their actions as lateral hip rotators are shown in volume two of this atlas. In this section, we're concerned to understand these two muscles simply as parts of the wall of the pelvic cavity. The obturator internus muscle is covered on the inside by this layer of pelvic fascia. There's an important line of thickening in the fascia called the tendinous arch. The tendinous arch goes from the body of the pubis to the ischial spine. We'll see why the tendinous arch is important in a moment.
Now we'll move on to look at the muscles of the pelvic diaphragm. These muscles form a sling which closes off the inferior pelvic aperture and supports the organs that lie within the pelvic cavity. On each side, the pelvic diaphragm is formed by two most unequal muscles, the small coccygeus muscle behind and the much larger and more important levator ani muscle in front. Here's the coccygeus muscle. It runs from the ischial spine to the edge of the lower sacrum and coccyx. Coccygeus is a vestigial muscle with no demonstrable function. Now we'll add the levator ani muscle to the picture. Here's the levator ani. The levator ani has a line of origin that's partly bone and partly fascia. In front it arises from the body of the pubis. Behind it arises from the ischial spine. Between these two bony origins, it arises from the tendinous arch in the fascia that overlies obturator internus. The fibers of levator ani pass downwards, backwards, and medially to meet in the midline with those of the opposite side, as we'll see shortly. Let's go round to the back to see the underside of levator ani. Here's the ischial tuberosity. Here's the sacrotuberous ligament. The space between these structures and the underside of the levator ani is called the ischiorectal fossa. In the living body, it's filled with fat. The levator ani is described as having a number of parts, which are named as though they were separate muscles. Unfortunately, the names of these parts are somewhat irrational. This part of levator ani is known as iliocoxygeus. Iliocoxygeus is very thin. This part is pubococcygeus. It's much more substantial. Pubococcygeus is subdivided further in ways that we won't go into. Now that we've looked at one levator ani muscle, let's look at the two of them together. We're looking from above. Here's the upper part of obturator internus. Here's the tendinous arch. The ischial spines are here. Here's the tip of the coccyx. Here are the coccygeus muscles. Here are the two levator ani muscles. Between them, in front, there's a gap, the urogenital hiatus, through which pass the rectum, the urethra, and, in the female, the vagina. The fibers of levator ani, which arise more posteriorly, unite in the midline with this fibrous band, the anocoxygeal ligament. The fibers which arise more anteriorly form a loop which passes around the back of the urogenital hiatus. Some fibers along the edge of the hiatus attach to the sides of the rectum, the urethra, and in the female, the vagina. We'll add the urethra and the rectum to the picture. Here's the lowest part of the rectum. Here's the urethra, with the lowest part of the prostate in front of it. We'll see these structures in volume five of this atlas. The levator ani and coccygeus muscles are covered over by this dense layer of pelvic fascia, which completes the pelvic diaphragm on the inside. The pelvic diaphragm supports the pelvic organs and closes off the pelvic outlet while allowing passage for the rectum, vagina, and urethra. When we're upright, the levator ani muscles are in a constant state of tonic contraction, which becomes greater or less in response to changes in abdominal pressure. The main action of the levator ani muscles is to keep a set of downwardly mobile structures, the pelvic organs, constantly in one place. In addition, vigorous contraction of the levator ani muscles pulls the lower end of the rectum upwards and forwards. Now that we've seen the intact pelvic diaphragm from above, let's look at it from behind and from beneath. Here are the ischial tuberosities. Here's the tip of the coccyx. Here are the sacrotuberous ligaments. 
Here are the two levator ani muscles. This is the ischiococcygeus part. This is pubococcygeus. Here's the urogenital hiatus. Here's the anocoxygeal ligament. The levator ani muscles are continuous on the underside with this cone-shaped sleeve of muscle, the external anal sphincter, which maintains closure of the anus. Here's the opening of the anus. The external anal sphincter is tethered to the anocoxygeal ligament by its most posterior fibers. In front, here's the divided urethra. The muscle surrounding it is the bulbospongiosus. Till now, we've been looking at the pelvic diaphragm in a dissection of a male body. Here's a similar dissection of the pelvic diaphragm of a female body. The overall structure of the female pelvic diaphragm is the same as the male, except that the pelvic diaphragm is also traversed by the vagina. Here's the opening of the urethra. The whole region between the coccyx, the ischial tuberosities, and the pubic symphysis is called the perineum. The area between the ischiopubic rami is the urogenital triangle. We'll look at the important structures of the urogenital triangle in volume 5 of this atlas. We've been looking from behind at an isolated dissection of the pelvic diaphragm with everything else removed. To get a more complete view of where we are, we'll now add the main surrounding structures to the picture. To see the pelvic diaphragm clearly, we've been looking at an unnaturally empty pair of ischiorectal fossae. In the living body, the ischiorectal fossa is filled with fat, which is traversed by nerves and vessels, as we'll see. Here are the sacrotuberous ligaments. Here are the ischial tuberosities. Here are piriformis and obturator internus, going to their insertions on the femur, along with the gemelli and quadratus femoris. Here's the sciatic nerve, emerging below piriformis. Here's gluteus medius. Here are the origins of the hamstring muscles. Here's the line of origin of gluteus maximus, which we'll add to the picture. The lower edge of gluteus maximus covers up the ischiorectal fossa when seen from behind. On the inside, the walls of the pelvic cavity are covered with a layer of loose connective tissue, which is lined in part by peritoneum. We'll see this in a minute when we move on to look at the blood vessels and nerves of the region. Before we do that, let's review what we've seen of the pelvic muscles. Here's piriformis, here's obturator internus, here's the tendinous arch, here's coccygeus, Here's the levator ani. This part is iliococcygeus. This part is pubococcygeus. Now we'll move on to look at the blood vessels and then the nerves of the pelvis and perineum. First, the blood vessels. Here's the pelvic cavity, seen from above, with the abdominal and pelvic organs removed and the soft tissue lining of the cavity intact. The pelvic cavity is lined, somewhat irregularly, with peritoneum. Beneath that, there's a layer of pelvic fascia that's continuous with the endo-abdominal fascia. The internal iliac artery, which we saw in the last section, is hidden just under here. To see the pelvic blood vessels, We'll remove one half of the pelvis and go round to a medial view. We'll also remove the lining of peritoneum, 
and pelvic fascia. In this dissection, the veins which follow the arteries closely have been removed to simplify the picture. The arteries of the pelvic region are all branches of the internal iliac artery. The way they arise is quite variable. This is the superior gluteal artery. This is the inferior gluteal. They pass through the greater sciatic foramen to supply the buttock region. This is the internal pudendal artery, which we'll return to in a minute. This is the obturator artery, passing forwards into the obturator canal, along with the obturator nerve. The most anterior branch of the internal iliac comes to a blind end. In the fetus, it's the umbilical artery. Branches to the pelvic organs arise in a widely varying fashion. These are the divided ends of the vesicle arteries, superior and inferior, which supply the bladder. This is the middle rectal artery, which supplies the lower part of the rectum. In the female, the uterine arteries also arise, directly or indirectly, from the internal iliac. The branch of the internal iliac that concerns us most closely here is the internal pudendal artery. It supplies the blood supply to the perineum. To reach the perineum, the internal pudendal artery goes out through the greater sciatic foramen, around the sacrospinous ligament, and back in through the lesser sciatic foramen. In this way, the internal pudendal artery ends up below the pelvic diaphragm. To follow its course, we'll go round to the back. The gluteal vessels and the sciatic nerve have been removed. Here's the internal pudendal artery emerging below piriformis. It passes behind the sacrospinous ligament, which is here, and behind this small muscle, the superior gemellus. The internal pudendal artery runs downwards and forwards along the medial aspect of obturator internus. Its branches supply the anal sphincter, the pelvic diaphragm, the external genital structures in the female, and the penis in the male. Now that we've looked at the blood vessels, we'll look at the principal nerves of the pelvic region. We'll look at the sacral plexus, then at the pudendal nerve, then at the autonomic nerves of the region. Here's the sacral plexus. Its lower part lies on the front of the piriformis muscle. The sacral plexus is formed mainly by the anterior primary rami of the spinal nerves S1 through S4. In addition, the plexus receives a contribution from L4 and 5 through this big nerve bundle, the lumbosacral trunk. The major branches of the sacral plexus leave the pelvis by passing through the greater sciatic foramen, either above piriformis or below it. Almost all the nerves that arise from the sacral plexus go to the lower extremity. They're shown in volume two of this atlas. The branches of the sacral plexus that do concern us here are the pudendal nerve, which is the principal nerve of the perineum, and also the small motor nerves to the pelvic diaphragm. A small branch or branches from S3 or 4 supply most of the levator ani muscle and the coccygeus muscle on their pelvic surfaces. Here's the pudendal nerve. It's derived from S2, 3, and 4. It arises from the plexus just above the sacrospinous ligament, which is here, and passes immediately through the greater sciatic foramen. To see where it goes, we'll go round to the back. Here's the pudendal nerve again. Here, next to it, is the internal pudendal artery, which we've already met. We'll go to an underneath view to follow the pudendal nerve. It passes forwards on the side of obturator internus along with the internal pudendal artery. Its branches supply the anal sphincter, the muscles of the urogenital diaphragm, and the external genitals. Lastly, we'll look at the autonomic nerves of the pelvic region. The autonomic nerves in the pelvis that belong to the sympathetic nervous system are the tail end of the sympathetic trunk, 
and the so-called hypogastric nerve. The parasympathetic nerves in the pelvis are the pelvic splanchnic nerves. All these nerves, sympathetic and parasympathetic, are connected to a diffuse and extensive plexus of autonomic nerves called the pelvic plexus. The pelvic plexus lies within the fascia that covers this part of the pelvic wall and floor. A small part of the pelvic plexus has been partially dissected out here. The pelvic plexus distributes the sympathetic and parasympathetic supply to the distal colon, the pelvic organs, and the external genital organs. Feeding into the pelvic plexus from above is the hypogastric nerve, single here but often taking the form of several small nerves. It's the distal continuation of the aortic plexus. Here's the distal end of the sympathetic trunk. It enters the pelvis deep to the common iliac vessels and descends just medial to the sacral foramina. It gives rami communicantes to the anterior rami of the sacral nerves. Lastly, here are the pelvic splanchnic nerves, sometimes called the nervi erigentes. These are the source of all parasympathetic innervation in this region. They arise in this case from S3, also often from S2 and S4. They break up into branches which enter the pelvic plexus. From the plexus, their fibers are distributed to the pelvic organs and external genitals. Now, let's review what we've seen of the blood vessels and nerves of the pelvic region. Here's the internal iliac artery, the superior gluteal and inferior gluteal arteries, the obturator artery, the ends of the cycle vessels, the middle rectal artery, the start of the pudendal artery, and its further course. Now the nerves, here's the sacral plexus, and the lumbar sacral trunk. Here's the pudendal nerve from the inside and from behind. Here's the area of the pelvic plexus. Here's the hypogastric nerve, the sympathetic trunk, and the pelvic splanchnic nerves. That brings us to the end of this section on the pelvis and also to the end of volume three of the Video Atlas of Human Anatomy.